This is Mrs. Alexander, and this is your 1.21 What is DNA front load lesson. This is a lot of information that you probably haven't learned yet up front. That's why I call it a front load lesson. It's all about DNA, the basic structure, history, and facts that you need to know for this unit. We will continue to learn more about DNA this year, but this is just the basis of what you're going to need to understand to be able to complete the next couple of assignments. Some quick facts about DNA. You need to know what it stands for, deoxyribonucleic acid. Understand it's so small that you cannot see it with the naked eye. You have to see it under a microscope, and when you do, it looks like a twisted ladder. And every living thing has DNA. That's what makes us unique. That means you have in, something in common with things like a zebra, a tree, a mushroom, and a beetle. We all have DNA. It's different, and that's what makes us unique. Vocabulary you need to know. DNA is made up of chromosomes. A chromosome is a tiny package of DNA coiled up. It can be seen under a microscope, and each human has 46 chromosomes. Depending on the animal or species or plant you are, or you're referring to, it has different numbers of chromosomes. Us as humans, we have 46. Chromosomes have thousands of genes on them, and genes are segments of DNA. They sequence a certain code, which creates a trait. Traits can tra are, are different examples and characteristics that we have, different color hair, our features. They, our genes contain those instructions for building different parts of the cell and giving us traits. Genes are responsible for holding our unique, specific nucleotide sequence in our DNA. What's a nucleotide? That's a subunit of DNA. It consists of three parts, a sugar, a base, and a phosphate. Here's an overall picture of the hierarchy structure of DNA. It shows a chromosome on the left, tightly coiled structure, kind of looks like an X. You unwind it and you get, go through and you get to see the different genes, uh, nucleotide sequences, all the way down to the different bases. You need to know that DNA has a negative charge. That goes back to polarity. We'll talk more about polarity when we start learning a little bit about um, electrophoresis and how DNA is able to be analyzed from person to person. But remember, DNA has a negative charge. When you look at DNA, it forms a double helix because there's two strains of DNA tightly coiled around each other, formed together with a backbone and bonds. DNA looks like a ladder, so if you were to make a ladder paired of nucleotides, you would always see that the rungs of the ladder would be pairs of bases, adenine pairs with thymine, and guanine pairs with cytosine. I'm going to use the letters A, T, C, and G to refer to those bases. Those are chemical bases found in your DNA. Whatever ratio of those chemicals you have is what makes every person unique. There are rules that DNA follows that allows certain genes and certain traits to be linked. Those rules are that adenine always pairs with thymine, or A and T, and guanine only pairs with cytosine, G and C, and that's for DNA. There's another structure called RNA that's also a nucleic acid, but we'll get into that a little bit later in the year. Here is a picture of a nucleotide. Remember, a nucleotide is the basic subunit of DNA, so it's like the Lego piece or the basic building block of what makes you, a human, have unique traits to your DNA. The circle is the phosphate, deoxyribosugar sugar is in blue, and the base is in green. There are four different bases we're going to talk about that makes each nucleotide different. So every nucleotide has a phosphate and a sugar, but the base it was what makes it different. So technically there are four nucleotides we're going to talk about today. The phosphate group looks like a circle. There's a phosphate in the middle with four oxygens bonded around it. They are covalently bonded together. The next is the pinto sugar. Pinto sugar, or also referred to as deoxyribose sugar, is a five-sided shape with carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, CHs and Os, and they kind of look like a five-sided shape, so we call it a five-carbon sugar. It is also found on the outside of the ladder, along with the phosphate. So a lot of the times we call that the sugar phosphate backbone. They form the sides of the ladder, or the DNA helix, and in the middle are the bases, As, Ts, Cs, and Gs. Here's a little quick definition for each one of them. They basically have the same definition. The big, biggest thing you need to know are which ones go together, pair up, why they pair up, chemically, structurally why, and also you need to know the category they fit into. So adenine and guanine, A and G, are purines. Cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines. Base pairing rules. A always fits with T. They're kind of like puzzle pieces. G always fits in with C. Why? Chemistry. Their structures fit together. How do you know? A lot of other scientists came way before we did, and they were pretty much smarter than I am, 
and they were able to discover certain things like ratios. And they looked at the different chemicals in DNA, and this one guy named Shargoff discovered, while looking at the amount of each chemical, that A and T were always the same chemical ratio, whereas G and C were as well. I like to remember a really quick um, device in my head, A, T, C, G. I like to think apples grow on trees and cars go in garages. So A and T go together because apples and trees and cars and garages. That's just going to help you remember which bases pair. Hydrogen bonds is the next way we know why this works. Hydrogen bonds are bonds that stick together bases in the middle. So on the sides, the sugar phosphate, phosphate backbone are covalently bonded. Those are really nice hard structures, the bonds are. But in the middle, there's a weaker bond called a hydrogen bond. And they can be triple bonds, shown here between C and G, or they can be double hydrogen bonds, showed between A and T. The double and triple nature does allow them to bond stronger or weaker. The purpose of a hydrogen bond is to be able to break those when we need to make more DNA. We can break them like a zipper or unzip the helix, and that will allow us to go in and match up more bases to create a template or a copy of DNA that we refer to as RNA. We'll get into that later. Another pneumatic device to remember is if I sh showed you this picture, didn't label any of the bases, C's, G's, A's, or T's, you would know that the A's and T's, the only one in this picture is this one right here, because A and T's always have two bonds. A, T, 2. G, C, 3. So remember that mnemonic device. G and C always have three. A and T always have two. If you look at the G's, they have two little rungs or two little um, rings on them. And so do the A's. That's what makes them pure rings. The C's and the T's, notice that they only have one ring. That's what makes them pyrimidines. That's called the chemical structure. So back to Shargoff. He not only realized that the ratios mattered, but then we looked into it further and were able to go in chemically and figure out the structures. What holds the thymine and the adenine together, the A's and T's, is adenine and thymine are in different classes or categories of bases. They're considered pyrimidines or purines. Purines have two rings. Purines have two rings. Adenine and guanine are our classes of purines. Adenine and guanine do not pair together. They do not pair together because they don't fit together. But they are in the same category. Just like pyrimidines have a single ring. And they are in the same category. T and C, thymine and cytosine. But they don't fit together. You have to have one purine with one pyrimidine in order for the spacing and the hydrogen bonds to work out correctly. So if you notice over here, a purine, sorry, a purine adenine goes along with a pyrimidine thymine. Over here, a pyrimidine cytosine goes with a purine guanine. Back to purines real quick. A little pneumatic device. How are you going to remember what categories they are? Well, A and G are purines. Think about it as angels and gods are pure, or purines. So A and G are purines. And over here, pie, mm, apple pie, cherry pie, there's all sorts of different types of pie. If you can just remember pies have one ring, remember cherry pie, okay? Then you can remember T and C, the ones that when you look at them only have one ring. Those are the pies, or the pie remedies. Hopefully those little tricks will help you out. So again, Shargoff figured out this stuff along with realizing the ratio. So ratios are like, if I have five of one thing and a five of another, that's a one-to-one -one ratio because they have the same amount. Two of one thing, two of another, that's a one-to-one -one ratio. So when he was looking at the chemicals, adenine and thymine, cytosine and guanine, he counted them up. He realized that they were always a one-to-one -one ratio. It doesn't have to be 50-50, like 50 A and T, and then the other 50% of DNA is C and G. No. Here, let's do a little math problem to help you out. If a DNA strand consists of 32% adenine, we know A and T have to have the same amount. So we know that there's going to be 32% thymine as well. What's 32 and 32? Good, 64. So if 64% of my DNA is made of A and T, 
and that leaves me 36 more percent of DNA left over. So 36% gets split up between my C's and G's, which would be 18% of each. So that's how thiamine would equal 32% and guanine would equal 18%. That doesn't make sense. Pull out a piece of paper, work it out, or ask me in class. There are a few scientists you need to understand um, that go along with the history of DNA. Rosalind Franklin is my favorite scientist. It's not just because she's a female, um, but her true sacrifice for the discovery of the structure of DNA is pretty awesome. She was just kind of a basic lab tech for a while, and then she got to go on university, and she worked with this guy named Maurice Wilkins. He didn't like her very much, according to the stories. Um, you know, back in the, that time, women just were known for being mothers and teachers, and there weren't that many predominant female scientists. Well, she was work working with a machine called an X-ray diffraction machine, and this took DNA live specimens and shot x-ray particles through them and created an image on a piece of paper or on an x-ray photograph of what the microscopic level of that organism looked like. If you look down in the bottom of this picture, do you see the x in the middle of the circle? That is the x-ray photo of a double helix. So it's like two strands twisted around each other. That's why they form an x. One strand is the left side of the X, the other strand is the right side of the X. That's the double helix that you're seeing in the middle. So you're seeing a double helix. I know it doesn't really look like it, but think it's back in the day when, you know, x-ray photos were very first of its kind. It took her 51 tries with this x-ray machine to actually get a photo that she could read and understand. That's why they called it Photo 51. Um, she shared her photo with Maurice Wilkins. They were pretty amazed, really psyched that they finally figured out that the structure of DNA was two strands because there were all these different theories going on at the time of what DNA looked like. And he called his buddy, James Watson and Francis Crick, over at a different university that were working on the structure. Well, James Watson and Francis Crick, they were trying to build a model based off of just what their, their data showed. Well, originally their model had the phosphate sugar backbone on the inside instead of on the outside, or they had three strands instead of two strands. They tried it a bunch of different ways. But after seeing her photo and realizing there were only two strands and the way that they were oriented, they were able to correctly arrange their model and become the first scientists and win the Nobel Prize for coming up with the structure of DNA, a model to show that. That was a pretty big deal because in order for you to get publicity about um, winning a Nobel Prize or get publicity published in a paper, you have to be the first scientist to prove that you came up with the idea. Doesn't matter if you were the first to have the idea or even to come up and, and do it, you have to publish your findings. Well, they won the Nobel Prize, and Rosalind Franklin had died before they won the Nobel Prize, and she actually died from the x-rays in the machine she was working with, so she got cancer and died. Now, you can go online and look at a bunch of stuff about Rosalind Franklin, and you can see that now they've altered that Nobel Prize to include her name in it after the family finally sued and said, hey, without her photo, you wouldn't have been able to do this, Watson and Crick. There are a bunch of cool, fun clips you can watch. There's actually a rap on here about Rosalind Franklin and... Um, if you have some time, jump on there and watch them.